can get started. We have about 30 people. So I, I am Shari Aragai. I'm a postdoc here at QForm. It's our pleasure today to have Jacques Carillon. He is a Marie Curie fellow uh, currently in Niels Bohr Institute in Copenhagen, and he will be talking about large scale quantum photonic processors. And I just want to remind our audience, if they have any questions, they can type in the chat and then Jog can decide if he wants to take breaks in the middle or just take all the questions at the end. So without further ado, Jog, you can take it away. Awesome. Thanks so much, Ria. Um, and uh, thank you so much for the kind invitation as well. I'm really excited to be speaking to you guys today. So um, I'm going to be talking about large scale quantum photonic processes. These are systems which store information onto the quantum states of light and process that information using photonic integrated circuits. And what I hope to show you is that by leveraging large scale foundry processes, we have a really promising platform with which to realize next generation quantum technology. So I'm going to talk a bit about the hardware, but I'm also going to talk um, a bit about some of the new applications, particularly at the intersection of uh, quantum photonics and machine learning. So uh, I'm currently at the uh, uh, Niels Bohr Institute at the University of Copenhagen. Um, I've been there a few months now, but I'm, I'm largely going to speak about work that was done uh, in my previous group at MIT. Um, so I'll take some breaks midway through and people can shout out questions and, and things like that. Okay, so I think it's fair to say that quantum computing um, has kind of become mainstream now. You know, you don't even need to necessarily read academic papers, you can just read a uh, read newspapers. So one that people might be familiar with is Google's recent demonstration of a quantum advantage. And what they showed was that a system of 53 qubits was capable of solving something that a classical computer cannot. So why is this interesting? Well, it's been conjectured for uh, many decades. That if you can store information onto a quantum system and process that information, you can calculate certain things much quicker than you can classically. Um, but up until recently, that hasn't been demonstrated in part because actually isolating that information from its environment is a really significant challenge. So because of that, this demonstration is incredibly impressive. Now, there are, of course, some open questions with regards to this, you know, how far can we push our best classical algorithms and, and really how useful are these kind of sampling algorithms. But from an engineering perspective, I think it's a really, really impressive demonstration. So there are many different ways in which you can build a quantum computer, whether that's some kind of atom-like system trapped either optically, electrically, or in some solid state environment, whether that's uh, superconducting electronics or whether that's using photons. Um, and, I, and I think it's, you know, typically this work was mostly done in a uh, uh, you know, university environment, but more recently we've seen significant uh, commercial investment with quantum startups. It's hard to get the exact number, but it's likely over a billion dollars. So even with all this excitement, both in the academic setting and in the commercial setting, I think it's fair to say that no one knows yet how to build a universal quantum computer. And what I mean by that is that you can scale up the number of qubits such that you can start tackling interesting problems and you can reduce the error down on those qubits um, such that you can correct these errors quicker than they accumulate. And there's many interesting open questions which need to be solved before we can even begin to think about this. And, and that's really where I see academia sitting in this kind of new industrial ecosphere. It, it, it is solving some of these critical questions. Um, but, but for me, one technology really stands out amongst all of these things, and that's photons. And that's for a few different reasons. Um, first, photons can be used to send information between each of these technologies, okay? Whether that's at the scale of meters between different DIL bridges, and we've seen a demonstration today from the folks at ETH Zurich, um, which allows you to build up something like a kind of quantum cluster computer, or whether that's the scale of kilometers, allowing you to build up something akin to the quantum internet. Um, secondly, uh, driven by significant amounts of investment in classical optical communications, we now have access to highly complex integrated photonics foundries um, that enable us to produce devices which are really challenging to do in a university environment. And then we can leverage them for our particular quantum application. <clears throat> 
moreover, we can access these things through um, cost effective measures like multi project wafers. And finally, I think what's really unique to photonics is that many of the same uh, technologies we develop for, for quantum applications will also have some really interesting classical applications, whether that's in low power optical computing, signals processing, or also in imaging. So in this talk, what I'm gonna do is give an overview of some of the key building blocks towards realizing these quantum photonic technologies. Uh, and in parallel, I'm gonna talk about some of the systems engineering challenges we need to overcome towards integrating these things within a single uh, reconfigurable system. Um, and then at the end, I wanna talk about um, some particular applications at the intersection of, uh, of quantum computing and machine learning. Okay, so why are you interested in photons? Well, photons have a bunch of really nice properties. They're incredibly fast, they're easy to control, notably at room temperature, and the stochastic noise on the photons is incredibly low. Moreover, there are many degrees of freedom in which we can store information on a photon. So for example, uh, we, can, uh, we can let uh, the vertically polarized light shown in red be our logical zero, and we can let the horizontally polarized light be our logical one. Uh, and we can move between those things using things like wave plates. Or we can store information in the path degree of freedom. So a photon in the top mode is a logical zero, and a photon in the bottom mode is a logical one. Um, and there are many other degrees of freedom we can store information on as well. Um, with integrated photonics, we have a way to manipulate light on chip in a phase stable and compact manner. And the way it works is that we have a high refractive index material surrounded by a low refractive index material, which effectively confines the light. And you know, it's effectively like having a, a, a fiber optics on chip. Um, and there are many different materials in which you can uh, use to guide the light on chip. So for example, at the bottom, we've got a silicon waveguide surrounded by a silica cladding. Um, passive control is enabled by things like evanescent coupling. So you bring those waveguides close to one another such that the evanescent fields of the waveguides overlap. And by tuning this interaction region, you can tune the uh, ratio of light that couples between these different inputs, which is allowing you to realize uh, beam splitters on chip. Or you can physically change the dimensions of the waveguide itself, allowing you to build things like on-chip cavities. That's going to be important for filtering or particularly increasing the interaction of the light with material. And then you can start seeing some funky nonlinear effects. And then for active control, we need some way of actively reconfiguring the refractive index of the material. And there are many different ways you can do this. For example, here you can pattern some thermo uh, some, some resistive material on top of the waveguide, you can apply a current, the waveguide heats up locally, and you change the refractive index by the thermal optic effect. And there are many different techniques in which you can do this, each with their associated bandwidth, and you can really select that for the particular application you're interested in. So because of the advances in quantum optics and then in integrated photonics, we have the field of integrated quantum photonics, which has been around, you know, I would say about 12 years. Um, and you know, it really started with the first demonstration of a uh, C naught in silica um, back in 2008. Um, it was quickly followed by uh, uh, the first demonstration of or one of the early demonstrations of, of Shaw's factoring algorithm, which uh, also in silica, which shows you that uh, 15 is three times five with high probability. Um, and then we can start adding reconfigurability into the mix as well. Um, and then we, with that, we can realize uh, uh, arbitrary single qubit gates. That's gonna allow us to do cool things like draw size into the block sphere um, and allow us to develop new quantum protocols um, one which many of you might be familiar with, which is a variational quantum eigensolver that was first developed and demonstrated on a photonic platform. Um, and then we can add more photons into the mix that's going to allow us to increase the complexity of this system. And we can start pushing that towards uh, trying to solve some problems that we can't do using classical computers. So this is just really a kind of a snapshot of uh, work over the past decade and there have been many many more uh, beautiful demonstrations in integrated quantum photonics and if you're interested um, you should check out this recent review which was in nature photonics 
But the point I want to make is that each demonstration here, and in fact, all demonstrations to date, can be classically simulated. Okay? We're not at the regime where we can start challenging classical computers. So the question I want to examine is what are the technologies we need towards building next generation quantum photonic processes? So in my eyes, there are four things we need to bring on to a single system. The first is we need some way to generate non-classical states of light. That can be squeeze states, that can be uh, uh, single photon Fox states, um, you know, it really doesn't matter. And essentially you can think about that as a, uh, you know, the, the non-classical light is essentially going to be the input to our computational algorithm. Um, and then we need to have some reconfigurability in the system, um, both in terms of linear circuitry and non-linear optical circuitry. And by reprogramming these guys, essentially we'll be able to implement different quantum algorithms. And at the output, uh, we need to have single photon readout. Um, and that will be the kind of output to our computation. Okay. So in this talk, I'm mostly going to focus on these first three. So let's talk about the reconfigurable circuitry. So the key to understanding the reconfigurable circuitry is realizing that the building blocks of linear optics are things like beam splitters and phase shifters. Okay. Where in the lossless case, each of these things is described by a two by two unitary matrix, where each element of the unitary matrix gives you some probability amplitude to transition from a given input mode to a given output mode. Okay. Um, and then you can just plug these guys together and simple matrix multiplication will show you that all linear optical circuits in the lossless setting are also described by unitary matrices. We can go one further with another key building block, which is the Mach Zender interferometer. So that's a phase shifter sandwiched between two beam splitters. Okay. And if we put light into the top mode, just classical laser light, and measure the output power in the top mode, and as we sweep this phase, what we see is a sinusoidal variation in its intensity as a function of that phase. And that's going to be important because if you can control this phase, you can essentially realize variable reflectivity beam splitters on the chip. Um, and we can even go one further with this. In particular, if you have a particular configuration of beam splitters and phase shifters, say for example in this triangular configuration, there are others, but let's take this for example, you can realize any unitary operator on those optical modes, okay? which means you can realize any linear optical circuit. And the reason this is important because it means you don't have to go and design and fabricate and test uh, different linear optical uh, circuits for different experiments, if you can build this one device, you can implement a whole variety of different uh, circuits and experiments. Um, and if you're interested, we recently put together a, a review article on these things. So um, during my PhD back in 2015 uh, at the University of Bristol, we set about trying to realize this device. Uh, and this is what we came up with. It was a six mode universal processor uh, in silica using planar light wave circuit technology. So the device comprises, uh, just a second. The, the device comprises uh, 15 max end interferometers and 30 of these thermal optic phase shifters. So if we zoom in on it, you can see you have this germanium doped silica core surrounded by a silica cladding. So the refractive index contrast between this core and the cladding is actually relatively small, which means that the device is pretty large. It's about the size of an iPhone 5. Anyone can remember what that thing is. <laughs> um, uh, you know, and I think the cool thing about this type of device is that we can, you know, it's reconfigurable, so we can implement a whole variety of different operations on one chip. Um, so we could do heralded quantum logic gates for the circuit model. Um, we could realize heralded entangling operations that allows you to generate bell states, which is going to be important for um, the measurement based quantum computing model. And we could also do um, quantum process tomography on this device as well. Um, essentially, we implemented all the things we could think of. But in my eyes, the most exciting thing about this reconfigurable technology is that it allows us to implement, uh, you know, to develop new protocols, things we hadn't thought of. So a few years later, also with my colleagues in Bristol, um, 
we showed that there's a really interesting mapping between these photonic circuits and uh, molecules. And in fact, you can use these photons in MOS to simulate the vibrational dynamics of molecules. So I'm not going to go into the details here, but you can read the paper if you want to look a bit more, but just to give an overview. The idea is what are photons in MOS? Well, they're non-interacting bosons. So what other systems are non-interacting bosons? Well, the vibrational modes of molecules are also non-interacting bosons. So what we give is essentially a recipe for how to program your circuit such that when you inject photons into different modes, it's like exciting a different vibrational mode of the molecule. And then by reprogramming the circuit and observing where the photons end up, you can observe the evolution of the vibrational dynamics, essentially allowing you to build up a movie of the molecule. So with anything where you're doing, you know, some kind of quantum simulation, you should always ask yourself, when will it be practical? Um, and in the linear case, where we just have linear optical circuitry, what you're actually simulating is molecules in the harmonic approximation. And it's likely you need about 50 photons to start challenging classical computers. Um, if you have some kind of non-linearity in this system, we actually don't know when it's going to be classically hard to simulate. It's likely to be much, much less than this. And critically, you're actually simulating uh, uh, molecules in the anharmonic, anharmonic approximation, which is much more interesting. But the key point here is that whatever we want to do, we really need to scale up this technology. And doing it in the platform of silica doesn't seem to be super practical. So for the past few years, I've been looking to scale this technology up using the platform of silicon. So the nice thing about silicon is that they have very high component density, um, essentially because we have a very high refractive index contrast between the core and the cladding. Um, so you can see here some of the beautiful uh, phase array work from the Watts group, and you get a few thousand optical components in just a few uh, hundred square microns. Um, now, the loss in uh, silicon can actually be pretty small. It's down uh, well below one dB per centimeter. But, but critically, the real metric we care about is the loss per component. So because the component density is so high, the loss per component in silicon you know, is pretty much unrivaled. Um, with silicon, as I mentioned previously, we now have access to incredibly mature photonics foundries, um, which we can use through things like uh, multi-project wafer runs. It's a very cost-effective way to do that. And another interesting part of, of silicon is that as a very strong chi-3 nonlinearity, which allows us to generate new states of light. Um, so then we can start think about integrating non-classical light sources on the chip and also reconfigurable circuitry. So just to zoom in on this non-classical light source, we can describe the uh, Hamiltonian for four-wave mixing in this kind of phenomenological way. And what it says is that if you pump the silicon with uh, a bright laser light and a pump frequency, you'll produce a signal, an idler, uh, you'll absorb two photons of the pump and uh, generate a signal, an idler, um, conserving energy. Now, uh, the interaction strength is, is relatively weak, so typically what people do is uh, fabricate micro-ring resonators. This is essentially um, an on-chip cavity. It's realized by a looped piece of waveguide coupled to a bus waveguide. And when the perimeter of the waveguide is an interesting number of wavelengths, we see these nice resonances occur. And what that allows you to do is essentially increase the interaction time with the material in a compact manner and actually engineer these signal and idler frequencies. And because of this, you can potentially have a very bright single photon source. It can be very compact and in principle, highly indistinguishable. So we wanted to show uh, quantum interference between these two different rings. And this is the device that we developed. Okay. So it's uh, fabricated in silica. Um, the waveguides are shown in gray. And you can see here that we have our uh, photon generation rings and we have some on-chip filtering and some phase shifters as well. Um, and actually schematically, it's pretty simple. Um, what we're really just doing is generating a pair of photons and then impinging them on a max-ender interferometer. Uh, 
Now, if you look at the probability of a coincidence, so the probability of a photon in the first mode and a photon in the second mode, you should see a sinusoidal variation with twice the frequency as you did in the previous case. Uh, and the reason why is because we've got two photons. So if we implement this and if we tune the actual phase shifter, the voltage on the phase shifter, what we see is something like this. Essentially, you get a very highly uh, asymmetric fringe. And the reason is, is because we're actually getting a lot of crosstalk between the different components on our chip because they're thermoptically controlled. Um, so to get around this, we had to develop an in situ feedback control protocol, which monitored the power, uh, the, the uh, classical laser power through the rings and fed back to re-correct any of the variations in the ring. And once we apply that feedback protocol, we see we actually recover this symmetry in the fringe. Um, our next generation device, uh, what we call a very large scale quantum photonic processor, um, comprises uh, many more max end interferometers. It's really a scale up. Uh, and what we have now is pump routing on the same device. We have single photon sources uh, and we have a large optical process of output. So these are our input waveguides, these are our output waveguides, and you can see the number of uh, wire bonds that are required to control the electronics on this chip. So it has about 80 max end interferometers, uh, micro ring resonators to draw light out of different frequencies, um, and it has about five, over 500 components in just a few square millimeters. And just to put this in context, you know, comparing it with the previous device that I showed a few years ago, we've essentially gone down an order of magnitude in scale and gone up an order of magnitude in complexity. And that's really what silicon photonic enable is that kind of scaling. And the challenge is, is that when you're operating devices of this kind of scale and this magnitude, um, well, you really need to develop new systems engineering uh, approaches. You know, that's really the challenge for here. So you have to be able to get your optics both in and out of the chip. Uh, so the chip here is in the center. Um, we have uh, custom built fiber rays which butt couple into the chip to get light in and photons out. Um, we need to have electrical control across about 300 different channels. So we have electrical routing from the chip itself down to a carrier PCB down to our control electronics and doing that all with very low crosstalk. And then we want to be able to manage the, the temperature of the chip just in case you know the, the air conditioning breaks in the lab or something like that. So the whole thing is mounted on top of the Peltier cooling system. Um, and with devices of this size and this depth, we have to come up with um, new methods to diagnose what kinds of errors might happen in the optics. So and I think a promising approach towards doing this is actually imaging the chip from above. So what we're doing now is injecting near infrared light from the left um, and tuning the chip during one of our calibration processes. And this is actually in real time. And as we image from above, you can see the scattering from the waveguide. So you know, for example here, um, this is our uh, uh, one of our max ender interferometers. Essentially that allow us to find out and determine um, if we have some kind of errors deep within the circuit. Um, and it's not just to produce cool pictures, we can actually use these to characterize our micro ring resonators as well. So now here's one of our micro ring resonators. Uh, we're tuning the wavelength of the light as it impinges on the ring, ring resonator imaging from above. Um, and as it, uh, as it hits the resonant frequency, it scatters from the, uh, from the ring and lights up like a Christmas tree. And then we can use that to actually characterize what those central frequencies are of these ring resonators. So I'm gonna move on now, but are there any questions particularly about the things that I've spoken about so far? I don't see any questions in the chat box, but if people have questions, please feel free to write it there. This something is... One question just popped up in the chat. Okay. Um, uh, uh, how does the propagation loss in silicon affect the 770 mode uh, silicon MZI processor? What's the total insertion loss compared to silica? Great question. Um, so for the, for the large um, chip that I showed, 
the propagation loss um, through the chip is, so we're seeing on these devices um, about uh, around one, one and a half dB per centimeter ish. So the actual loss through the, uh, you know, the straight of the waveguide is about one centimeter. Um, so it's, it's about one to two dB. Uh, the main loss that we see um, is, I think what Avix alluding to, is through the, um, uh, through the coupling in and out of the chip. Um, so what we actually have are some mode converters. Let me just go back. I can't go back on this. Um, what we actually have are mode converters uh, in silicon nitride, which expand the mode. And that gets us down at the moment to about two and a half dB loss per facet. Um, on a good day, maybe we can see two dB per facet. Um, and, uh, you know, but people have shown much better than that. Um, so, yeah, that, that's really the uh, loss. And comparing with silica, you know, silica is incredibly large. The mode is basically the size of, um, uh, you know, the mode is basically the size of the uh, single mode fiber. So, um, uh, you know, the loss there is incredibly, is incredibly low. Um, okay, I'm going to actually just, if I can go back on here. So another question, are you having to calibrate each optical element in the circuit and then adjust for variation? or are some self-calibrating? You know, it's a great question. We have a serious code base that sits on top of this entire chip um, to do the calibration. Um, so we have a protocol which goes through each of the, um, you know, each of the devices, calibrates each one, routes the light based on that calibration. Um, we repeat that maybe once every few weeks if we're really trying to nail down, you know, something very precise or correct for some kind of thermal crosstalk, we might do that more regularly. So we do have to do each one, but essentially it's automated. Okay, great. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to, I'm on a new keyboard, so unfortunately I can't actually go back, which is rather annoying. Okay. Um, uh, okay, that's how we do it. Great. So, um, if there's no more questions, uh, I'll move on. And uh, I want to talk now about how do we get, you know, everything I talked about was, was, was linear interaction through linear optics. How do we get some kind of non-linear light matter interaction. So why do we care about that? Well, um, I think it was nicely summed up in this, I think, beautiful paper by Terry Rudolph, um, where he's really kind of extolling the virtues of the silicon photonic route to quantum computing. And there are a couple of upsides to uh, all photonic quantum computing. You have uh, potential compatibility with CMOS technology. Uh, the stochastic errors are very low. But the real challenge for the all optical approach is entangling operations. Essentially, entangling operations using linear optics are probabilistic. And to turn that into something that's near deterministic requires significant amounts of multiplexing. So you have to detect where the photons ended up, you have to delay the ancilla photons, and then feed back into some low loss switching network. It's a significant overhead and significant challenge towards doing that. So what I've been pursuing in, in the past, uh, say, six months is actually mediating this interaction with some kind of atomic-like system. And in particular, looking at three, five semiconductor quantum dots. And the way it works is that you have a low band gap material, such as indium arsenide, uh, embedded in a higher band gap material, such as gallium arsenide. Um, and what that gives you is a strong quantum confinement and essentially a discretization of the energy levels for electrons and holes. So essentially, you have an artificial atom on chip. Um, and moreover, by fabricating things like nanoplatonic structures around these devices, um, you can really engineer the spontaneous emission into a particular mode of interest. So now within our group, you know, these devices are really seeing some of the most high performance single photon sources out there. Um, you know, I think Peter's going to talk a bit more about this in a few weeks, but just to give you a, a, a kind of preview. Um, you know, we're now seeing visibility stretching out for hundreds of photons from the same quantum dot um, of over 96%. Um, still, the uh, efficiency, you know, it's around 14% we have a pretty clear path towards increasing that efficiency. And by efficiency, I mean the, you know, the probability if you shine light on the quantum dot that you get a photon in a fiber. 
Um, so because we have this very strong light matter interaction, essentially at a single photon level, we can think about doing single photon switching through a saturation effect of this two level emitter, which essentially allows us to um, saturate the emitter and, and prevent light from uh, exiting the waveguide. Now, um, it turns out that two level systems actually aren't sufficient to do high fidelity photon photon gates. You actually need some other kinds of, uh, you need a multi-level system. And however, quantum dots can also do that as well. So essentially you can load a charge onto the quantum dot um, and then apply a large, a large magnetic field which breaks the degeneracy of the ground state. And then you can access this multi-level system. It's essentially like having a spin on chip. And through this, you can potentially have uh, high fidelity photon photon gates. So one of the challenges of this kind of technology are that there's spatial variation in these quantum dots. They're epitaxially grown, so you essentially don't know where they're going to be. Not only do they spatially vary, but there's also spectral variation as well. Um, you know, these quantum dots are incredibly sensitive to the local charge environment, the local strain environment, so you'll actually see a large um, inhomogeneous distribution in these lightweights. Um, and the second is how do we make them compatible with these kinds of foundry photonic integrated circuits that I was talking about previously. Um, I think a really promising approach is to actually do this via hybrid integration. So what I'm actually showing here is some really beautiful work um, that actually Sharia was involved in and Jae Yun. So the idea is that you take your uh, quantum dot chip, um, say in your 3.5 material, and then you take your photonic integrated circuit, say in silicon photonics, and you pick and transfer over uh, the 3.5 material onto your uh, photonic integrated circuit. And by engineering the dimensions of this uh, waveguide, you can really engineer the efficient, engineer the light transfer from the quantum dot into the waveguide mode that you care about. And in principle, this can be quite high. And what this allows you to do is essentially uh, pre-select the quantum dots that you want to transfer over for a particular frequency and a particular bandwidth. Um, you can then think about using uh, the photonic integrated circuit to actually control these kinds of quantum dots as well through techniques such as strain or start. Um, and for any of the folks that have done these kinds of transfer before, um, you know that it's incredibly uh, specialized, which is a polite way of saying it takes an incredibly long time. Um, so, but that, you know, but that doesn't mean this process isn't scalable. Um, and you can really think about doing some kind of uh, the same wafer wafer bonding approaches, uh, which people are doing to transfer lasers over into silicon photonics. So potentially there's a promising approach towards integrating these uh, artificial atoms into large scale PICs. And if you're interested in this, we recently put together a re review article on it for Optica. Okay, so this is about everything I'm gonna talk about in terms of hardware at the moment. Um, are there any questions in terms of hardware? Okay, um, if there is any, you can still put things in the chat and I'll come back to it in a bit. Um, so now I wanna talk um, I think it's critical when you're building any kind of particular types of applications you might want to implement. Um, Notably, what these applications will do is actually drive your hardware, your hardware development. Um, moreover, these applications can actually be inspired by your hardware and make use of particular features of the hardware. You know, so the idea, I guess I see, is that you try and push your hardware as far as you can and develop your algorithms so you can eventually do you know, more with less and you can meet somewhere in the middle and actually deliver practical quantum technologies. And that's critical because many different quantum computing platforms have very unique features. Um, for example, in photonics, one of the things we really care about is loss. Um, so the primary error mechanism is loss. 
And that's going to be really problematic if you want to build up something like a quantum network. And loss in your fiber is going to prevent that quantum information making it to your particular uh, nodes. So one way to get around this is to encode uh, a single qubit of information across multiple photons such that if the error occurs, the information can still be recovered. So just to give you an example, this is what we call a 4-2 code. So it's four photons in two modes. And you store a logical zero in the state 4-0. So that means four photons in the first optical mode and none in the second optical mode. Um, and zero, four means zero in the first and then four in the second. Um, and then your logical one is stored in the state 2-2. Two, two. Um, and note here that we completely agnostic to the particular optical modes. This can be in frequency, this can be in polarization, it really doesn't matter. Um, and what you can show is that if you can realize this particular operation, okay, you can correct for single photon loss uh, without uh, measurement and without a quantum memory. And that's what we call a one-way quantum repeater. Okay. So, that's kind of nice and I can write down this you know, operation, but I have no idea how to build it. I think this was really nicely captured by uh, some recent work by uh, uh, Miatu and the Luckenhaus group. And they said, we do, yeah, they wrote down these Hamiltonians and they said, we do not yet understand how to determine if a given Hamiltonian can be implemented or approximated to a satisfactory degree by arranging a reasonable number of optical components. We don't know how to build the thing. <laughs> what you really want is some way in which you can train your photonic processor to actually implement a operation of interest. And when you couch it in these terms, it sounds a little bit like something that some of you folks might be familiar with, which is neural networks. And essentially with neural networks, you have a computational model that you want to train to implement a particular input-output configuration, you're going to train it on images of cat and it's going to recognize what a cat is. Um, can we do the same with a photonic processor, but instead of cats, can we do it on quantum states? Okay. Um, and I think it's also worth noting here is the, the architecture I've drawn for uh, this neural network and requires linear matrix operations and requires nonlinear uh, operations. And wow, that sounds a little bit like some of the stuff. I've been talking about for the past half an hour. Um, so we set about uh, coming up with an architecture to actually realize some of these quantum optical neural networks, essentially a method to program these quantum optical systems. So this is what we came up with. It's a computational model, just we're exploring this in simulation, um, and a quantum optical neural network has some input state of uh, FOC uh, photons, so FOC photon input state, one photon per mode. Um, then we perform some linear transformation. That's just these reconfigurable circuitries. And then we need some kind of nonlinear interaction. So in this computational study, we just considered a strong Kerr interaction. It was in the monochromatic approximation. It was incredibly strong. Um, you know, these things are, are very hard to realize in reality, but just for this ex you know, exploration, that's what we looked at. And we repeat this thing for many layers. And at the output, we count where the photons are. So the idea is that we're going to vary these parameters to realize a particular transformation on the input photons. So how do you go about training this type of thing? Well, uh, this whole operation is described by a matrix in the multi-photon basis. And you want to take some set of input states to some set of output states. So you can just define a cost function which quantifies this distance. So in the language of machine learning, you can then minimize this cost function. And that's how you go about training that system. Um, so we looked at a few different kinds of operations that might be interested in. Uh, we looked at uh, realizing a particular Hamiltonian of interest. So you take some Hamiltonian you care about, say the icing Hamiltonian, you exponentiate it, um, and that gives you a unit tree and you can train your photonic uh, quantum optical neural network to realize that particular Hamiltonian. Um, and we actually see something kind of interesting with this as well. As we increase the number of layers where this is one of our layers, 
um, the error in realizing a particular Hamiltonian goes down. And this is a feature we're actually pretty familiar with in, uh, in neural networks. It's a notion known as expressivity. Deeper neural networks can express a richer class of functions. And what we're seeing now is that deeper quantum optical neural networks can express a richer class of Hamiltonians. We then looked at a classical reinforcement learning problem, balancing a pole on top of a cart. We show that we can train our system to do that. Now, I'm not saying we get any kind of quantum speed up while doing that over classical systems, but it's interesting that our, uh, our, our simulation, our quantum simulation, can actually learn on that classical data. And finally, we wanted to implement this one-way quantum repeater. And as we increase the number of nonlinear layers, we see that we reach the machine precision of, our, uh, of the simulation. So then what you can imagine having is a little one of these quantum optical neural networks, maybe sitting in some kind of cryostat um, in a quantum network correcting for single photon loss. So the caveat here is, is very much that this is, uh, you know, we consider highly idealized nonlinearity. And I think it's super interesting, important to understand what this system is capable with, capable of um, when you use a much more realistic nonlinearity. So are there any questions about the quantum optical neural network? I have a question, Jacques. Uh, are you going yes. to talk about maybe a more realistic nonlinearity or like what are your thoughts on how would people actually make this? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. It's a really great question. Um, I haven't got any slides on that, but I'm happy to talk about it for a minute. Um, I think a really promising approach and kind of why I alluded to beforehand um, is actually using some of these quantum dot systems. That's what we're actually uh, simulating now. Um, with these two level emitters that are strongly coupled to the waveguide, what types of operations can we do? Now, it's very likely that, um, you know, we won't be able to do uh, universal computing with that, um, but there might be an interesting class of operations that we can do. So I think that's certainly interesting to look at. Um, in my eyes, perhaps the most uh, uh, promising approach towards doing this is with things like um, uh, ultra-cold atoms in optical lattices. Essentially, you've got a Bose-Hubbard Hamiltonian. That's really what this thing is actually implementing. It's a Bose-Hubbard Hamiltonian. Um, but then it's about how can you reprogram the actual optical lattice. And there's been some really amazing advances in that, um, also particularly from uh, some of the folks at Stanford as well. Um, so, you know, this is, is very much just not in, a, uh, in uh, an, an optical system. It's really a much more general any case of bosons. So the first quantum optical neural network might not be uh, in the photonic setting. Okay. So, um, you know, I, part of, I think this is kind of interesting that we can borrow some tips and tricks from machine learning and, and apply it to quantum. And that kind of got me think about this more generally and applying some tricks from machine learning to an important problem in uh, near term quantum computing, which is the problem of verification. So with some of my collaborators, um, we started looking at this. How can we use um, machine learning inspired techniques to solve some of these uh, verification problems? So for a lot of these near term quant uh, quantum processes um, and near term quantum algorithms, if you squint at them, they all kind of look the same. <laughs> Essentially, you've got some input state and then you per perform some kind of quantum circuit and that gives you an output state. And what you want to prove is that the probability distribution that's defined by this input state, so for example, here X can be the set of bit strings in the computational basis, sampling from this probability distribution is classically hard while quantumly efficient. Okay. So to couch this in a kind of verification terms, we want to turn this question on its head and say, given access to this output state, what can we learn about this unit tree? Okay. And why are we interested in that? Well, I guess there's the first part of it is, you know, using this verification, if you're gonna spend 
hundreds of millions of dollars trying to build a near-term quantum computer, you better be sure as hell it's doing something hard. <laughs> so this might be one kind of tool in your arsenal to do that. And the second, it's just a kind of fundamental reason. It's actually, for me, interesting to try and understand what are we able to learn from quantum states. In particular, for many of these um, kind of these quantum states related to these sampling algorithms, it's not clear what you are able to learn. There's not a huge amount of structure in these quantum states. So to just kind of clarify this question a bit more, we asked, given knowledge of psi in and access to psi out, learn an operation that efficiently returns this input state. In other words, can we unscramble the action of an unknown unitary on a known input state to learn these inverse of these black box dynamics. So a kind of naive way to approach this question might be to get another quantum circuit with some parameters you can control and look at the output state and vary the parameters such that the total output state is the same as the input state. Okay, so essentially you know that you would have done the identity. So uh, over um, w one single state. So to couch this in terms of uh, machine learning, you can define a loss function, you can minimize that, and over this single state, if this is zero, um, you've implemented U dagger. Now there's an immediate reason why this is a really bad idea, which is that this, on average, scales as one on the dimensionality of the system, right? Because you're trying to find the overlap between two states in Hilbert space, and Hilbert space is exponentially big, so just a counting argument tells you that this is gonna scale exponentially badly. So um, essentially the challenge is to break this problem up into efficient chunks of Hilbert space, okay? Um, so what we did was we took some inspiration from neural networks and developed a layer-wise learning approach to break this problem up into efficient chunks. So let's imagine the total input state was all zeros, and you know that. So you pass it through your scrambling circuit, and then you feed that into an n qubit circuit, um, where, and then you optimize the parameters, but only to find the first qubit in the state zero, okay? And if you find that guy in the state zero, you've essentially disentangled that qubit from the remainder of the state, okay? Which means that the rest of the state is in a, in a pure state. So then you can take the remaining n minus one qubits, feed that into another quantum circuit, an n minus one qubit quantum circuit, vary the parameters to find the second qubit in the state zero. And you repeat this for a total of n times. So what can we say about this loss function now? Well, now this loss function scales as a constant of the number of qubits. In fact, on average, it's gonna be about one half. Um, and the reason, the way you can see this is because we're trying to find the first qubit in the state zero and half of all qubits in Hilbert space have zero as their first entry. Okay, it's just a simple counting argument. Um, so once you perform this protocol, Essentially, you can go and just inspect these particular circuits that you dialed and find out uh, what the solution unitary was. Uh, and if you don't get the solution unitary that you expect, you can, you can perform some kind of reduced tomography on this qubit to really understand where that error came about. Um, so I haven't really spoken at all about uh, the types of processes that they implement this. I haven't spoken about a particular platform. And in general, each problem in each platform um, will have to use a particular ansatz towards doing this kind of optimization, okay? And importantly, you wanna choose an efficient ansatz. Um, so we set about implementing this protocol in photonics, um, where now we have photons coming from uh, a source uh, from spontaneous parametric down conversion, we then inject that into our programmable photonic processor. We, uh, the processor has a large amount of reconfigurability and much redundancy, so we can use part of the photonic circuit to realize this scrambling circuit, U, and then we can use other sections of the photonic circuit to realize this unscrambling circuit, um, layer-wise. 
So the photons come out, they feed into superconducting detectors, and then we feed back electrically on the circuit to minimize the particular cost function. So for the first layer, we optimize the parameters, we want to minimize this loss function, and then we hit the noise floor of our uh, experiment. So now we have a photon in here, and then we look at a photon in the second mode, we vary the parameters once more, and after about 20 iterations, we hit the noise floor of our experiment. So what this potentially means is that we have a route towards doing some kind of uh, you know, verification of, of near-term processes. Um, I'll just very briefly say that one of the challenges with all variational algorithms is what do your gradients look like? And there's a problem which we see is that as you have very deep circuits, um, you get uh, very, very uh, shallow gradients. Um, but potentially because we are essentially using a layer-wise approach, we might be able to drastically reduce the depths of these circuits um, and potentially ameliorate some of these barren plateau issues. That still remains to be determined, but it's a super interesting research direction. So um, I've spoken a bit about uh, different ways in which we can generate non-classical states of light and different kinds of reconfigurable opt uh, linear and non-linear circuitry, and also about some of the applications we're interested in. Um, in the last just two minutes, I just want to give a bit of perspective of what I think some interesting research directions. Um, I think some really exciting opportunities go with scaling up these optical matrix processes. I think it's reasonable to get to of order 100 optical modes. In part, this is going to be uh, driven by significant amounts of investment in optical neural network companies. Um, you know, light matter and light intelligence. And that's really going to accelerate this. And if you start pushing up the number of optical modes, um, that's going to enable new opportunities in optical machine learning. We can think about building um, uh, you know, the optical equivalent of an FPGA for optical signals processing, and even imagine new imaging modalities using these optical modes. Um, if we start incorporating some of these nonlinearities, we might be able to push towards actually useful uh, molecular simulations and think about different types of quantum machine learning protocols, such as uh, recurrent protocols, for example. Um, hybrid integration offers some really exciting opportunities. Uh, we can think about adding new materials, such as phase change materials, which might allow us to do uh, quasi-static phase tuning for incredibly low power phase tuning, or also uh, in cryogenic systems. Uh, we can think about adding electro-optic materials into this as well. Um, you know, that's going to allow us to do things like low-loss, fast modulation. Uh, I'm particularly thinking about materials like lithium niamate and, and barium titanate. There's some really impressive results in both of these materials. Um, and we could even bring new types of emitters and new kinds of quantum memories on there as well. And finally, if we can bring up the co-optivity of these uh, uh, of these quantum dot cavity systems, we can really start thinking about uh, you know, multi-level systems. And if we can do that in a low, enough, low loss enough manner, uh, we can think about quantum repeaters and maybe one day um, universal quantum computation. So uh, I wanna thank a bunch of colleagues in academia um, and also some of my colleagues in the industry, uh, both in the quantum side and the photonic side. Um, and of course, all of our funders. And uh, thanks so much for your time. I'd be happy to take some more questions. Thank you so much, Jacques, for a fantastic talk. Uh, we are about an hour, so I'm going to stop the recording, but people can still ask questions if they would like to in the chat, or I can just unmute them. <laughs>